Cool. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so my talk today is mostly a story. Uh, it's a story about something that I call disaster code, which is a place I think that many of us in this room have probably been at one point or another. Uh, and if, if you have, or even if you haven't, uh, this talk should give you a pretty good idea about how software design, uh, or the lack thereof, uh, can impact a code base. And I'll also share some simple ways to fix uh, some of the more common problems that affect a lot of websites today. So my name is Dan Gribben. I'm a software engineer. Um, I'm based in Rochester, New York. I work at a company called Brand Networks. Um, and I'm also a web development teacher at a organization called the Rochester Brainery, uh, which is an organization for low-cost education in the Rochester area. Uh, but my day job is at Brand Networks. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, most of my development responsibilities are on the front end. Uh, many days I live in JavaScript, CSS, HTML, um, and it's also part of my job there to put a good amount of thought and care into uh, the development process the, past the act of simply writing code. Uh, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in the past six months is uh, just how critical design is to the development process. And uh, not design in the sense of graphics or artwork, uh, maybe a a good word would be architecture. But the word design seems more appropriate, and to me it indicates something a little bit more intentional. The word design actually means a plan produced to show the function or workings of something before it's actually produced, and before being the key word. So when I talk about designing code, I'm talking about planning out a system before a code is even written. More specifically, I'm talking about planning out the best available solution um, to the current problem, but given the current constraints, which there are always constraints. This not only helps us to avoid disasters, but it actually makes the process of writing code even easier and more efficient. Um, so we're not just diving in and seeing where we come up, uh, but we actually have a map to show us where we're going and how to get there. Without that planning, development often becomes sort of a haphazard, careless, needlessly iterative process. And disasters can easily develop. You'll notice I said that they develop and not they happen. Um, and that's because disasters rarely just sort of happen in software development. Often it takes time for the effects of poor planning um, to really sh take shape and be noticed. And the iterative nature of software development is really what contributes to this. Poor practices over multiple iterations, multiple releases add up and you find yourself in like, literally a disaster. Um, and I'd like to illustrate my point a little bit uh, by talking about the project that I'm currently working on at Brand Networks and its recent successes and some of its failures. That project is called Alpine. Alpine is inter an internal name, not the actual name of the product. Uh, but Alpine is a young website that I work on with about 20 other people and it serves a variety of content to its users. Uh, that content mostly consists of articles, videos, and we also allow our users to contribute content to the site as well. Alpine's initial launch was sort of under very tight deadlines. Um, we had very limited front end resources. Um, so in order to get the product out the door on time, the team needed to work pretty quickly. Now you've probably heard this saying, good, fast, cheap, pick two. It's absolutely true, and it definitely applied in this scenario too. We were really eager to please our stakeholder, um, as most of us are, since they're the one paying the bills, but, but we poorly communicated this concept to them. And what resulted is that our plan, the plan to prepare the future um, of the product, what the front end of the product would become, it didn't really exist at the level that it should have, the level of complexity, detail, um, in terms of team size and as well as the scale of our code base and what it would become. So there was minimal architecture and design for the front end, and some poor software practices went unchecked during the de initial development process. And so this is where our technical debt began. Now, from, if you're not familiar with the term technical debt, um, I sort of pulled this off of Wikipedia because it's a good summation of what, what, it, what basically technical debt is. It's work that needs to be done before a, t a particular job could be com considered complete. If the debt is not repaid, It'll keep on accumulating interest, and it'll make it hard to implement changes later on. Technical debt leads to something and sort of is, goes hand in hand with something uh, called software entropy. Entropy is sort of a borrowed term um, from the second law of thermodynamics 
basically relating to, to complexity, right? Um, and two rules sort of apply to software entropy. One is that a computer program that is, uh, a computer program that is used will be modified. And the second is that when that program is modified, uh, its complexity will increase, provided that one does not make an effort against that complexity. And this is pretty much exactly what happened with Alpine. It's kind of a classic case. Um, there wasn't sufficient effort against the complexity. So after launch, the site needed to move forward with features and bug fixes like pretty much every project ever. Um, and our stakeholders, like all stakeholders, had a desire to see their product iterate and move forward. So things really needed to move forward within given time constraints, which, which, which are always there. Um, we're a development team that practices Agile. Um, Agile, if you're not familiar, um, teams that practice Agile organize their periods of work into iterations called sprints, and during which something is worthy of delivery is produced and then released at the end of that. Um, so how do we release in two weeks? Well, we have a limited time to release new feature updates and actually fix bugs, and the approach sort of becomes make it work any way you can. I'm sure you've all been in that situation if you've been developing software. Um, you have to get things out the door, you just have to do what's necessary. Um, and that kind of sucks, right? Um, and the absence of convention and architecture that already, that, that condition which already existed in our code base um, allowed technical debt to pretty much accumulate every single sprint. So this is a sort of a simplified view of it, right? But you get the general idea. Um, so more poor code, hacks, hacks to get fixes out. Um, really only adding to the entropic state that our code base was already in. And our team was also getting bigger at this point. Um, we were adding new developers to the project pretty regularly. And we really, since we had no good way to ramp them up, they, like the rest of the team, just started writing code wherever they could because they couldn't find a, uh, you know, uh, an appropriate place to put something. So you just, everything basically just became a hack at this point. This might be sounding familiar to some of you. Um, and at this point, really, with our code becoming more and more entropic, we started feeling the effects of two major problem areas, uh, performance, site performance, and maintainability. And the first major por uh, problem was performance. When I joined the project several months ago, shortly before these performance problems started rearing their head, um, when I joined, loading times were as long as 15 seconds on certain pages of our site. Now, I'm sure most of you have dealt with slow websites, just on the internet in general, but obviously 15 seconds is an insanely long amount of time for a user to wait for a page to load, right? Um, I don't know of many people that have the patience to sit there for 15 seconds. And obviously this is a worst case scenario, right? Uh, most of our users weren't actually waiting the full 15 seconds, but this is, this is our worst case. So our engineering problems have actually now manifested themselves as a poor experience for our users. And the experience is really clearly suffering in a, a, a very tangible way at this point as a result of poor practice. From the perspective of our, of our stakeholders, of our client, this is you know, most likely a deterrent to new users and also existing users. And a frustrating experience is obviously something that will decrease user engagement or use of your product. So some of the effects that we were seeing on our, on our, on our page load time uh, there were a lot of them, and it was decidedly hard to pin them down because our code was sort of indecipherable in some places. Three major things that were happening. Um, a lot of render blocking scripts, which I'll cover in more detail. Um, we we're also loading all of our resources on all of our pages. So the entirety of our JavaScript code base and the entirety of our CSS was being loaded on every single page on all, all across the site. <laughs> Also, with all of that code, we weren't minifying or compressing uh, any of it. So just massive files of JavaScript and CSS being loaded on every page, and users are just waiting just uh, up to 15 seconds for a page to load. So you can see uh, what, what, what we're really up against here. I'll talk just in just a minute about how we fixed some of these problems, but performance wasn't the only area we were suffering in. Uh, maintainability was a burden as well. When I say maintainability, I'm talking about how easy it is to fix a bug or make a change um, without that breaking the entire site, right? Or even portions of it. 
It could be something as simple as adding a CSS rule um, or something more complex like changing the process of how a user registers for the site. It was mostly just impossible to really measure the impact that that change would have um, on other unrelated components. If you're wondering how maintainable your site is, if you're sitting there wondering and thinking about the effort to re required to really fix a bug of any size, if that thought scares you, you might want to pay close attention for the next 20 minutes. At this point in Alpine's life cycle, it was becoming increasingly difficult to fix things. Dev time for pretty much all feature work was increasing and our velocity or the amount of work that we could complete in a sprint was decreasing. Now the cost to unmaintainable code bases is not insignificant um, and can cause a lot of frustration with both sides, you and your stakeholders, in three main areas. Some things that were contributing to our maintainability problem, we had a lot of globals. Global scope, a lot of JavaScript that was being included everywhere and depending on everything else in a way. Um, also a lot of intermixed functionality or sometimes as we call it spaghetti code, right? Impossible to trace um, the line of functionality from initiation to actual ex execution and what all the steps in between were. Also our SAS was problematic, right? We were using SAS but we were, weren't using it very well. Um, we had a lot of long and confusing selectors, really terrible naming conventions, lots of abbreviations, things that didn't make any sense. So it was sort of unmaintainable in the way that uh, it was hard to decipher exactly what styles were being applied where and what styles depended on other styles and what would happen if we changed one of them. Also, none of them were really logically separated into separate files. They were all in sort of conglomerated in one uh, and in bigger files. And also, uh, we are hitting IE9 selector limit. If you're not familiar with that, you get 4,096 selectors in one style sheet, per one style sheet for IE9 and back. We were running into that uh, regularly and what, what happens is the browser just drops the rest of the styles in the style sheet and you're left wondering where your styles are. So we were hitting that pretty regularly and having to, again, work up hacks to really figure out why this was happening. There's a third area that the project was suffering and it wasn't insignificant. Um, team morale, entropic products really affect the teams that work on them. After all, our software problems don't belong to one person. Um, your disaster is also the entire team's disaster. And as engineers, it's really in our nature to make things better, right? Um, so when we have an entropic product that's difficult to work on, the effects on the team are not insignificant either. And poor morale affects things all across the board, both inside your team and out. Um, things like relationships, um, productivity, motivation. Um, so obviously being in this situation is not really fun for anyone involved, um, from a co-op engineer all the way up to the highest ranking stakeholders. We really wanted to make things better. Uh, but finding time to fix our problems was pretty difficult because we hadn't appropriately and effectively communicated our problems with our stakeholders. The team took some time during several sprints to try to fix some of these problems that were weighing us down. And we, we implemented a simple build process, uh, we compressed some of our code, we optimized some images, we moved some parts of the page to asynchronous loading, all really, really great things to be doing. Um, but unfortunately, the results still left us pretty far from where we needed to be. Uh, performance improved really slightly, but it was impossible still to effectively and efficiently work on the code. Um, and it was at this point that we were sort of realizing uh, the full extent that of the work that needed to be done. We really needed to start over. Now, if you're working for someone else, you don't really want to be the person to have to tell them <laughs> that you need to start over. <laughs> and so, um, that was, that was an interesting process. Um, and this, this I, unfortunately I need to skip this part just for time's sake, but uh, we finally communicated our problems. Uh, we reached a point where the client was aware, right, of, uh, of the troubles that were plaguing our project, why they were seeing slow page load times, because again, our poor engineering project, uh, processes have manifested themselves visible to everyone. 
So arrangements were made for a small part of our team to develop long-term fixes for the product. And this was really welcome news for everybody, right? We were all kind of anxious at this point. We've got like a new life to the team at this point. Um, and we were anxious to build something that we could be proud of. Uh, we knew that refactoring would be complicated, but starting from scratch really let us take a fresh approach to old problems. And so we had a lot of planning meetings, we had a lot of discussions, we discussed what techniques, technologies to use. Um, it was kind of exciting because as engineers, we love to take advantage of things that people have already done and things that make our lives easier. But it was really important that this time we take the right approach, not necessarily the quick one. And uh, we knew design obviously would be a critical part of this process. And so a lot of time went into architecting Alpine. Um, which we, the new version of Alpine, we would call Neptune internally. So Neptune would involve us taking on one page type. All of our editorial pages, including articles and videos, would be completely refactored, um, started completely from scratch, and that still leaves many pages of the site, but it's a start. So we investigated, we spent time determining where the biggest problem areas were and how we should set up. And as we investigated, we found that for as much of our JavaScript actually sucked, some of it wasn't so terrible, but all of it was terribly organized. And this is what made our code base so unmaintainable in the first place. So organization was a top priority for our new effort. Um, and separation was key to that organizational process. So after several design meetings um, and lots of just discussions, uh, we decided that MVC was uh, gonna be a, a good decision for our front end. Uh, MVC stands for Model View Controller, and you've probably heard a little bit about it. The idea is basically that you break your application up into layers, um, each of which kind of handles a, a specific type of functionality. Uh, models represent data, controllers handle the business logic of your app, and views handle anything that the user sees or interacts with on, uh, on your web page. So MVC is just a pattern, right? Um, but there are actually a million, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, literally a million frameworks out there that help you get started and uh, ramp up very quickly. This is just a few of them. Um, in fact, some of these are actually being talked about today and will be talked about tomorrow at this very conference. Um, we'd love to be able to take advantage of one of these, um, but we needed to know if one, of these, if one of them was right for us or would even work for our current situation, right? Um, we recognized that several constraints were actually on us here. The combination really of time and existing expertise was our major limiting factor. If we, if we elected to use a framework, how long would the ramp up process take? We were given a limited amount of time for this refactoring process. So we just, we, obviously frameworks have learning curves, right? Every, every new technology isn't, it's not an immediate ramp up process, it's not an immediate solution. There is a time cost at the beginning where everyone is getting to be proficient with that technology. So was one of these even right for us? Could we even ramp up in time? Um, we ultimately decided that for a specific situation, uh, mostly due to those time costs, we'd use the MVC pattern in our own way, we'd implement it in our own way, and we didn't elect for a framework. Gasp. But we knew that we'd wanna make, it, make use of as much existing technology as possible. We certainly did. Uh, AMD, which is asynchronous module definition and require JS, uh, turned out to be central components of that solution. We'd handle the separation of functionality by manually splitting our code into layers, and we'd let require take the reins on dependency management. And it fit our, fit our needs actually really well. Um, plus, a lot of us had already had, on the team, had already had prior experience with require.js. Uh, so we ripped, kind of ripped our JavaScript apart, we put it back together, uh, we grouped related bits of functionality and really geared a lot of it towards reusable components. Um, here's a look at the main parts of our front end stack. Um, you probably recognize most of these. Um, we were already using SAS, but we ripped all of it apart. We reworked, reworked our selectors to be more maintainable, um, shorter, more reusable, and more efficient. Um, and we renamed a lot of selectors to make it more readable and maintainable and semantic. Um, we also grouped related bits while still preserving as much as we possibly could from what, what, was, uh, what was there before. 
And we also uh, moved ourselves to a client-side rendering model with pre-compiled handlebars templates. Um, we have a browser support model that actually allows us to safely kind of use newer technologies and techniques without worrying about so much legacy support, which is a luxury, and don't get used to that idea. <laughs> um, our oldest su supported browsers can actually handle a, a little bit additional client-side load without a significant impact on performance. And plus, a lot of the team had already used handlebars, so that was great for productivity. And we're also using Grunt. Uh, we expanded our use of Grunt to um, run our unit tests that because our code now testable, awesome. Uh, we can run unit tests, so we're using Jasmine for our unit tests um, and Grunt for all of the kind of standard uh, issue plugins, uh, compressing and minifying um, and things of that nature. This is a really high level view of Neptune. Um, I really don't have time to cover everything, all the work that went into it. Um, but the results, when we got, when all was said and done and we released our first iteration, um, the results were kind of mind blowing. Uh, we cut our page load time by 80% across the board. Uh, much of that was really due to cutting out all the unnecessary cruft that we were loading, taking advantage of a lot of caching techniques, um, and loading our scripts at the bottom of the page uh, rather than the top, which actually turned out to be a pretty huge deal. We also had um, some more maintainability gains, um, more intangibles but definitely noticeable. Um, the maintainability, it's, it's kind of crazy when I, when I get a bug report, when I get a ticket, I can actually know where to go to fix the bug rather than having to do a find in project literally for everything, so that's great. Uh, we also set up a really great framework for future work, so we're gonna be moving the rest of the site over. Um, we've got a framework, we've got a roadmap, uh, an example for n both new developers to look at as they start moving code over and also ourselves. And like I mentioned, we also have testable code. We designed our code to be um, as testable as possible. Running unit tests is amazing for ensuring reliability. So uh, where did we suck? Well, we're not perfect, right? Uh, we couldn't have possibly done everything perfectly. Uh, and the one area that we unfortunately sucked at was estimation. Uh, one of the things we really didn't do great at was estimating the time it would really take us to complete that initial refactor. Um, we really drastically underestimated. But estimating is pretty difficult, right? Um, as evidenced by this wonderful tweet here. One of the reasons that it's difficult is uh, that good estimations come from using the past, gauging your future work against it. Uh, since this was kind of a new undertaking for us, our estimates were admittedly kind of a shot in the dark. The team has learned some amazing lessons from that since then, and uh, we're using that for our future estimations. But another positive thing that really came from this refactoring phase was something that I hadn't actually anticipated, um, and that was a really, really great teamwork experience. It was really great to get to know some of the engineers that I hadn't gotten to know before, um, that I hadn't really talked to before. And it was awesome to really see them bring their best to the table. Um, I consider myself incredibly lucky to work uh, with the entire Alpine team and the team that worked on Neptune just really continues to blow me away with their uh, awesome talent for writing really good software. But even if you don't have an awesome team like I do, I, I do wanna give you some suggestions, um, some things that you can do now and in the future to clean up your front end. Complete refactors are not always an option. It's important to keep that in mind. Um, you're lucky if you'll, get, if you'll get the opportunity to do something like that with a really problematic code base. But there are some things that you can do to help yourself out. So cleaning up basically means three things to me. Um, optimizing for performance, promoting maintainability, and ensuring reliability. And these are huge, huge topics, right? I could easily devote an entire talk to each one of these, maybe multiple talks. Um, but there are good places to start, and uh, keep in mind that although your project may start small, it may be small right now, uh, maybe you have a small team, maybe it's just you, um, you might f someday find yourself in a similar situation to Alpine. So you probably use your dev tools all day for tweaks and um, just general debugging. They're really your best friends here. Dave and Brian both talked about debugging with the dev tools, and I really don't want to overload you guys with uh, info about that. So definitely, if you miss their talks, watch their, watch their videos when they come out for some really good info. But investigation is always the first step to figuring out, figuring out your woes. 
uh, figuring out exactly what is causing a slow render time uh, will help you pin down problematic code. Using the timeline feature, uh, you can help, you can, you can track down uh, long running functions or blocking synchronous functionality that is locking up your browser. Page speed insights, I think Dave mentioned this one as, as well this morning, um, is an awesome and simple way to track down your performance problems. Uh, it'll actually give you some great suggestions on things that you can do to just speed up your front end. Um, and also, if you aren't using image sprites for your icons, you absolutely should be. This is a huge thing for us. Um, this can actually help load time a lot by eliminating network requests for images uh, by combining many images into one file. Also, be careful not to load up your sprites too much. If you find you're only using a certain group of icons on one specific page, split your sprites up into more logically separated sheets to even further optimize them. Also, browsers pause to load JavaScript in many cases. Um, if your scripts are being loaded before the browser starts parsing the DOM, uh, that means a longer period of time until your user actually sees content on your page. And some long running functions could easily slow down rendering. Also, include your scripts at the bottom of the page instead of the top. That, ha that can have some really big benefits in that area as well. Some of the optimization process can actually be fairly automated, freeing you up to have more time to think about better things like designing software. Uh, so how do we automate this? Well, there are a lot of tools, uh, several tools, that were written for many OSs to work with Windows, Mac, Linux, um, that will read your JavaScript and CSS files and perform handy tasks on them. In the olden days, Sonny, when I was your age, uh, no, I'm 28, but the make file has been a widely used tool for really uh, similar processes um, for a while, has kind of taken on a new form um, in, new, in, in a few new JavaScript tools that make developers' lives a lot easier. Um, Grunt came out a few years ago and has a vibrant, really vibrant community um, built around it with a lot of useful plugins. And Gulp is sort of newer on the scene and has actually really impressed me with, this, with its speed. So which one should you use? Uh, whichever one makes you happy. <laughs> Grunt and Gulp are really two similar tools that can handle many essential tasks automatically and sometimes just go about it differently. Um, so, whichever you, so use whichever makes the most sense for your situation. Uh, but get to know both of them yourself so you can make that decision um, consciously. A lot of what I'm talking about today is really situational. And knowledge is the first step to making any good decision. So really do your own research and form your own objective opinions. Um, OK, philosophical lecture over. Uh, many of the same plugins exif exist for both systems, and I'll take you through a couple of them. Uh, if your site has a lot of resources, whether that's CSS, JavaScript, or images, really the idea is to minimize the amount of code that you load on any page, right? Um, tracking down unused styles is a really good first step uh, to cut down on file sizes. Uh, there's plugins for both Grunt and Gulp that'll help you do that. Um, combine and minify your JavaScript. This one is huge, huge, huge. Uh, the more files the browser has to load and the bigger they are, uh, the longer the browser has to wait for them. Combining uh, to one of each, optimally, cuts down on network requests. And there's uh, both Grunt and Gulp plugins for this as well. Also use an image optimizer for shrinking your files, uh, your image file sizes without sacrificing quality. Um, many of the pings and JPEGs you get could stand to be optimized quite a bit. You can see a lot of file size savings on that. Um, so there's plugins for this, but there's also um, apps, GUIs, that will work um, pretty much on any operating system you can find out there. And also following just some best practices in your code. This is one example, um, just caching jQuery selections. I'd really encourage you to check out Adam Zontag's uh, screencast on this subject, which is available on Boku's training website um, on caching jQuery selections in your code and the impact that that can have on UI performance. So promoting maintainability. Uh, this is obviously kind of a, a really huge topic as well. Um, but organization is really key for a maintainable code base. So a few things you can look into for short-term fixes. Um, if you're using SAS or less, don't fall into the nesting trap. Um, SAS, and, SAS and less are really both handy tools. Um, and nesting is a really great feature that can make your styles more readable. So instead of writing out multiple selectors each time, you simply nest them, um, which is awesome, right? Really readable um, and fun, but it can also lead to disaster SAS. 
And I want to show you an example of what I mean. I pulled this right from our code base from a uh, previous, uh, I guess it was probably a couple months ago, uh, from a commit a, a couple months ago. But this is real, folks. Um, that's, and if you're not catching on, that's really, really bad, OK? Uh, that compiles to this CSS selector, which to override that, we'd need a selector with a higher specificity and importance. So you can see how this might get out of hand quickly. What, like, what if all your styles were like this? Incredibly long selectors, hard to override things, completely unmaintainable. Um, how about this instead, right? Um, readable, reusable, and maintainable. Also, this one is an old one, oldie but a goodie. Uh, don't use important, right? If you need to use important, you have bigger problems to worry about. Also, um, I'd really encourage you to collaborate on a standards document. Um, standardizing everything from coding styles to naming conventions, right? Um, and include the entire team, your entire team on this process. Ideas about coding standards can sometimes be like a religion. Um, but if you don't have agreement across the team, it can be really divisive. Um, and research also shows that involvement can increase buy-in in a process like this. So collaboration can be an effective and really positive teamwork experience. And as your team gets bigger and your code base grows, uh, these processes become even more and more critical. Um, organization through separation is, is even, becomes even more of a big deal. And making sure your code is in a state where you can have the entire team working on it uh, without, with minimal conflict, right, is, is a really difficult thing to do. Fortunately, there are things you can do to help yourself out. And as I've talked about, modularization is um, kind of key to this whole process, breaking things up into separated and related components. Modular code really helps you create extensible features. Enforcing separation of style, presentation, and behavior is also a, another really big one for maintainability. Um, so just as an example, using class names for on-the-fly style adjustments instead of applying inline CSS is a lot more maintainable. Um, it's re uh, reusable and also much more consistent with best practice. Um, keeping JavaScript out of your HTML means really only having to look in one file type for JavaScript. So instead of using the on-click attribute, uh, using JavaScript for event delegation. This is a really small list of ways that you can help yourself out. Um, I really do wish I had time to cover more. Uh, but there's one more topic that I'd like to cover, and it's about helping yourself out in a slightly different way. During a process like refactoring, or even just during normal working conditions, it can and will feel as, as though the dev team and your stakeholders are at odds with each other. Business goals and technical goals near, nearly always conflict with each other. Um, the dev team will have its ideas on which areas of the site need attention and your stakeholders will inevitably have their own priorities, which generally push yours out. <laughs> um, and I'm not an account director and I'm not a project manager, so my interaction with stakeholders is pretty limited, but I've learned a few important lessons in the past few months about relationships uh, with stakeholders that I'd like to share. The first is that clear and understandable communication is an absolute must. Um, when you're building new features and you're planning work, Communicate with the stakeholders in terms that really they can understand in terms of their business goals. Communicate that the quicker solution will often lead uh, to more time and cost down the road. Uh, your stakeholders' business goals may obviously take precedence, and understanding those goals is important for better thought sync. Also keep in mind that negotiating is very possible, and it's very important. Keeping both sides in mind um, is also very important. So great client relationships are possible, but it takes work, uh, negotiation, and a lot, a lot of communication to get there. Uh, just in conclusion, remember that this is, this is all effort against complexity, against entropy. Uh, making effort against this complexity benefits many, many people. You, future you, uh, your team, your stakeholders. Um, Dave stole this from me earlier, which seems to be a recurring thing now. But any, two pro any programming team has at least two programmers. You and you three months later. Absolutely true. So make future you love past you. Um, this probably isn't taught to all CS students. Um, since during class, you actually, you usually start with a clean slate in class, right? Um, this is really something that you learn with experience. Keep the future in mind. 
Another thing that comes with experience is learning that there really is no perfect tool, framework, library for every situation. Um, really planning and designing software for the situation at hand is, the, is a really a crucial skill that will turn a good dev team and a good developer into great ones. Thanks.